تلاقيني أنا لهلي أنا أنا دمي فلسطيني Welcome to Poetry of Immigrants. We're glad you're back with us. This is show number 15. It's a continuation. Palestinian poetry and painting. And we're in for a treat. We're going to hear some musical perfection in poetry. We're going to hear some Arabic. And uh, we're going to feature some really special poets. And some of the names you may have heard for the last show. So, I have two very special guests. Mr. Faisal Salah is back, and he is the director and founder of the Palestinian Museum U.S. in Woodbridge. We have some more examples of paintings which are coming in for the opening of the museum on April 22nd. We have Miss Dina Omar. Oh, a special guest today who's reading her own poetry, or we'll share back and forth, but she has a lot to say about the poetic process. So welcome. Thank I'm you. so honored and so excited because I enjoy the spoken word. We are celebrating what's called spoken word performance which is a revolution that happened in 1985. I'd like to point out some symbolic associations because poetry is all about symbolic association. We have the sailboat welcoming people to the United States from all over the world. We have the pear cactus back there. We have some Arabic writing. We have Palestinian col colors and I have a New kafir on. Thank you. Happy to wear it. So I'd like to start with a ritual that we usually do at the beginning of a show. And I read a blessing. And this blessing is from someone I've read before. He um, is a 52-year-old poet from Ireland who passed away mm -hmm. not too long ago. A big loss. He wrote a book called To Bless the Space Between Us. And the interpersonal relationships show in great quality here, as you'll hear. He addresses all the concerns of society. This one happens to be about our leaders and leadership. So as I uh, center myself, and take a moment to pause, to get into his frame of mind. I'll share this with you. For a leader, quote, may you have the grace and wisdom to act kindly, learning to distinguish between what is personal and what is not. May you be hospitable to criticism. May you never put yourself at the center of things. May you act not from arrogance, but out of service. May you work on yourself, building up and refining the ways of your mind. May those who work for you know you see and respect them. May you learn to cultivate the art of presence in order to engage with those who meet you. When someone fails or disappoints you, may the graciousness with which you engage be their stairway to renewal and refinement. Uh, John O'Donohue is the poet. He calls them blessings, but I really hear the poetry in them. Moreover, with the poet's craft uh, and metaphor, which is a device he uses awful. often. He's in a tradition of Celtic poetry. He's wonderful. Um, would that our leaders worldwide could read this in the morning and begin a day more open-hearted. Welcome, Dina. 
this is an opportunity mm -hmm. to hear your voice. You have brought some poetry by other poets? Yeah. Um, Great. I have. Do you want me to read them? Uh, and some of your own poems. Yeah, I'm happy um, to read them. I, I would love to talk mm -hmm. about family. Mm -hmm. Family is essential. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the wisdom of our elders. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to start with uh, a mm -hmm. poem that you have on a family member. Uh, yeah, so, <coughs> I mean, first and foremost, thank you so much for having us on and for uh, reading that poem and, yeah, just giving us a second to reflect on certain um, things that oftentimes don't, people don't pause to really they don't think pause. of pause. Yeah. And poetry requires a pause, mm -hmm. as we were talking. Mm -hmm. You really need to take in the power of the word. Yeah. Otherwise, we could just be skipping over the surface like a rock on a pond, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. the way the media treats language. Absolutely. It's funny. Um, you were just saying uh, the sort of spoken word revolution in the United States started in 1985. Uh -huh. um, and so many, it's become a cultural phenomenon. Um, and not to say kind of redactically that Arabs did it first or something, but there's like this huge tradition in the Arabic language uh, of, for example, I guess what you would call spoken word poetry, right? In the Hejaz, before the time of the Prophet Muhammad, you had people, ha huge, huge festivals. Before? This, yeah, which is the reason why Mecca is Mecca. Oh. Huge, huge festivals where people would go up and read poems and um, uh, and all of them were poems that uh, evoked uh, longing, a celebration of the Arabic language. Um, uh, yeah, and so... Cultural touchstones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's good to know. So this is pre-Muhammad. Pre-Islamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Liter poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. And the yeah. part of the culture celebrated the spoken word. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a wonderful thing to know. I mean, that's a bedrock foundation There are about for today. 10 famous uh, poems from that era called the Golden Odes. The Golden Odes. Odes uh, in Arabic, al muallakat mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. And those are considered masterpieces of the pre-Islamic uh, poetry. Can you recite one? Um, unfortunately, I, I don't memorize them by heart. Yeah. Uh, but in general, uh, these odes, uh, the poet would begin by reminiscing about mm -hmm. his, his uh, family and his, where they used to live uh -huh. uh, and uh, any beloved women he knew at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he would mm -hmm. move on to extol about, to talk more about his bravery in battle and his generosity. Uh, the Arabs uh, are known for being extremely generous. Uh -huh. And there are many anecdotes and stories about the generosity of the Arabs in pre-Islamic and post-Islamic uh, era. That's another good yeah. cultural mm -hmm. characteristic. That's a mm -hmm. touchstone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could recite one line of poetry from one of those odes. I'd love to hear it. So in Arabic it goes, so he, uh, he had a, a, a friend or a lover or a girlfriend called Khawla. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talking uh, about where they used to live. As you know, in the desert, people move from place to place. Mm -hmm. What's left behind, he's saying, uh, the ruins of, of, the, of where she lived uh, appear like... Uh, old uh, tattoos on the back of the hand. What so an like, image. Uh, mm. uh, uh, and then he, from there he goes on to, uh, to say how sad he is as he remembers th those places in those times. This is pre-Islamic. Mm. Pre-Islamic, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Mm. And then you learn it as a child. Oh yeah, we studied at school. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. part of the culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I mean, I think that that's one thing as a Palestinian who's been born and raised in the United States, my appreciation for poetry definitely came from my father and my mother who, you know, went to school in Palestine and 
you know, poetry and the arts were always part of their curriculum. They had to memorize so many poems uh, when, ever since they were like kids. Um, and just having that in the back of my mind. I know that I, for example, had much more sort of arts education and literary education than, for example, my nieces and nephews that are going to school today. Um, and that's something that's a, a bit concerning, especially considering exactly what you said earlier, which is how loose language is used in the media and how it's not necessarily re um, yeah, uh, revered in the same kind of way. Exactly, well put. And of course, it all goes back to sacred texts, mm -hmm. which is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so you have yeah. a poem that you're willing to share yeah. about a family member. Mm -hmm. so I would love to hear it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to write, read this poem. Uh, it's called Sido Abd Samad Walks His Donkey to Taybe. Um, and just a, so I'm from a very small village uh, called Ramun. It's in the West Bank. Um, and the village right next to our village is called Taybe. It's one of it's one of uh, the only breweries in Palestine. Uh, it's a small Christian village, really nice. Um, and it's about my grandfather who passed away two days ago, Oh, so um, this is in honor of your grandpa. Yeah, and uh, he lived his entire life in Ramon, and so. And what's his name? Uh, Abdus Samad. Say it again. Abdus Samad. Abdus Samad. Mm -hmm. How old was he when he passed away? I think it was 98. 98. 99, yeah. And when was the last time you saw him? Um, so I was there in 2016 in the springtime. And I was actually supposed to stay there for a year and do f my field work for my PhD. But then last time I tried to get back in, I was denied entry. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wasn't able to you know, close off the year with my family there. Um, but yeah. So you remember him well. Yeah, yes. I do. What a wonderful thing and to have. He was, one of, he was one of these people, why is he so special? I don't know, have you ever heard of Walter Benjamin? He's no. A philosopher, a Jewish philosopher, um, continental philosopher. He once wrote this essay called The Storyteller, where he asks a very simple question, which is, who's a better storyteller, the man who lives in one village his entire life and knows the comings and goings of this one particular place, or the traveler who goes abroad and comes back with these stories. Uh, right, and I think my grandpa, why he was so special for me, is he knew everything about the village. He was like an oracle, like a, a chronicler of everything that happened in this one particular village. Yeah. The village elder. Yeah, absolutely. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. What a good memory to have of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you were close. Um, yeah, I mean, as close as you could be considering mm -hmm. the geopolitical circumstances, right? Like yeah. Palestinians are a diasporic community because of, you know, so many extenuating circumstances and pol politics and exactly. the and occupation. The difficulty of checkpoints and returning even. Mm. Um, I should point out, uh, just in reference uh, to Dina's uh, inability to go back to visit, uh, uh, Israel and its supporters uh, in the U.S. have a, a campaign to um, kind of uh, blacklist uh. any Palestinian who speaks against the occupation and against Israel. Uh -huh. And there's actually a website. Uh, they would put your name on it and list you there. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, uh, for me, that website is the honor list for Palestinians. Exactly. How unfortunate, uh, though. But, but it, it's so discriminatory. It yeah. is. And it, it so goes against the principles of, of the country was built on of freedom of speech. If you say something, you go on a blacklist and then you're punished for the rest of your life. You can't visit your loved ones. You can't go see where you grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an inhumane uh, uh, process. As we spoke last week in, last week, ah, last month, <laughs> how quickly time goes, yeah. um, a freedom of speech is a given here. Mm -hmm. It's, and I have a couple examples of Palestinian poets mm -hmm. who because they spoke out in poetry, mm -hmm. they were um, reprimanded. 
completely cut off mm -hmm. from society in terms of being able to speak their truth. Um, and the contrast between that is so, so horrible mm -hmm. to understand as a poet mm -hmm. because we're all about mm -hmm. the spoken word, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. freedom of an open heart. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good, a good grounding for us. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read the poem? Okay. Uh, the title is Sido Abd Samad Walks His Donkey to Taiba. Walks his donkey. Sido mm -hmm. means grandpa in Arabic. Grandpa. Sido. Sido. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, every day Sido wakes up before sunrise, shivers in the space his skin spends against the dawn air. He plunges his limbs into a jug of water he uses for abulations. After Fajr, prayer, as the sunlight creeps from under Jericho, he gathers his treasures for breakfast, steaming bread from the tabun oven, quiet as he chews one single cucumber and dips his spoon into yogurt. He bites the meat off the pith of the zaytun olive. He dresses himself in a clean pressed linen distasha and a western style suit jacket, open toed shib shib and a kufiya fastened with an agal around his head. He calls his donkey over for their morning journey. Wow. They walk together. Sometimes Sido places his hands on the donkey's back. Mostly Sido's hands are clasped behind his own back, looking down towards the earth that for some reason was brighter in the past. Not because of the cataract's film amassing his eyes, but because there are less and less feet along this path and no one breathing body to stop and say salamat or to ask what they are preparing for lunch. Above the hill with rotting wheat, and past the cemetery he buried my father in, just Sido and his donkey stroll past the unripe figs and juniper bushes, away from the quarter of land not yet divided by brothers and families, and past the 300-year-old furry almond tree arched to touch the soil, bending as the curvature of his wife's back, her dear song, her name was Aziza. She bore him eight children, three of them buried near my father, five alive, and four live in far away Amrika. Sido's proud to know that his family lives in Amrika, with their big lives, working for their big money, not knowing that the wind which dusts his face with the sand and scent of orange blossom intermingled with burning trash blows against time. And we here in this northwestern wilderness living our big lives, making our big money, we look at Sido Abdus Samad and think, this is the way one ought to live. Oh, that's so moving and has so much love that you're conveying. Thank you. Thanks so much for reading that. That's so personal. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to just read it. Oh, and it's brilliantly constructed mm -hmm. with all the salient details that make him come alive before my very eyes. Mm -hmm. The hands behind the back, mm -hmm. the donkey, mm -hmm. the proud man in his village. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think one of the biggest or most uh, aggressive violences that Palestinians have to sort of deal with mm -hmm. is this idea that whatever is going on there is out of I don't know, some sort of spite or hatred against other people, and it's not. It really comes down to one's home and one's family and mm -hmm. one's, like, just people that you're connected with and wanting to defend and protect those people. How basic. Yeah. How natural. Mm -hmm. And it is land and mm -hmm. family mm -hmm. and culture. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what it's all about, especially coming from the land. Yeah. Um, I think you should publish that widely. <laughs> yeah. Most of us have that chord in us for mm -hmm. a grandparent yeah. who represents mm -hmm. our culture, our family. Mm -hmm. Very, very moving poem, but you ground it so mm -hmm. beautifully in the mm -hmm. details. That's the mark of a true poet. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for me to not just write about Palestine, sort of, uh, as a category of person, yeah, right, in general, but rather to write about my grandpa, 
Exactly. Right. And, um, you know, if there were, for example, special interest groups or ways to, you know, categorize people based on whether or not they're grandparents or whether or not they're grandkids versus whether or not they're part of a national identity, right? The wor I think, you know, those are the cool things that we could do with language. Exactly. Right? And the way that language sort of, you know, maps onto the way we live our lives. Yeah. Truly. Um, we're um, kind of in an interesting place, too, when you are contrasting uh, modern Western life mm -hmm. and uh, the superficialities that we normally tolerate every day, mm -hmm. which keep us blinded and um, fenced off mm -hmm. from the deep meaning of land, home, family, mm -hmm. which you capture. Mm -hmm. um, and the naturalness of life yeah. being construed as something politically nefarious is so poisonous. Yeah. No wonder why I get the picture now. Mm. I'd like to share a few lines of uh, Mahmoud Darwish's mm -hmm. poem. Um, it's, it's a very powerful poem. I spent the whole morning on Tuesday reading it over mm -hmm. for its subtleties and also for its details. But since we're in that place, mm -hmm. I'd like to interject it now. Under siege, here on the slopes of hills facing the dusk and the cannon of time, close to the gardens of broken shadows, we do what prisoners do and what the jobless do. We cultivate hope. A country preparing for dawn, we grow less intelligent, for we closely watch the hour of victory. No night in our night lit up by the shelling, our enemies are watchful and light the light for us in the darkness of cellars. Here there is no eye. Here Adam remembers the dust of his clay. On the verge of death, he says, I have no trace left to lose. Free I am so close to my liberty, my future lies in my own hand. Soon I shall penetrate my life, I shall be born free and parentless, and as my name I shall choose azure letters. You who stand in the doorway, come in. Drink Arabic coffee with us, and you will sense that you are men like us. Who, you who stand in the doorways of houses, come out of our mourning at times. We shall feel reassured to be men like you. He opens his poem with an appeal to common human nature. Mm -hmm. We are like you. Mm -hmm. um, I was also struck um, by his background. Mm -hmm. um, I had not realized that his first love was Israeli. Mm -hmm. um, she was a dancer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> he was a young man, young pup. She was a dancer, mm -hmm. um, I think in Ramallah. Mm -hmm. And then they mm -hmm. drifted apart. It was a two-year romance. Mm -hmm. And then according to this book, um, Kingdom of Olives and Ash, um, he realized she joined the military after a while. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if whether the poem, Rita and the Rifle, evolved from that. I'm not sure because there's a rifle between them. I think the story is that she um, joined a military kind of dance quartet thing at oh. some point. Mm -hmm. um, and she, you know, the thing about Darwish and just poetry in general is super, he, his command of language is just impeccable and amazing. Stunning. But the, yeah. Um, and <laughs> we only know that, like, you know, in I read Arabic and that's yeah. also in translation, so, you know, we're only catching a glimpse of it. We are. Um, but the way, so Rita, at least, you know, she's a character mm -hmm. um, who is informed by his real life, but comes up all throughout his sort of poems and, and throughout his texts in different forms, right? Oh, she does. She yeah. reappears. Mm -hmm. In um, his book, uh, 
uh, memory for forgetfulness, for example. Uh. You know, it's a it's a fictional book, but it also has so much truth to it. Brings and, in biography. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wow. funny the way in which, like for example, Darwish's legacy as a poet. Um, at some point, I think he felt a bit constrained by by the by identifying as Palestinian and not necessarily as a poet who can have universal appeal, uh, informed by the Palestinian experience. Exactly. Right. And That's a struggle. Mm -hmm. I thank you for filling that out because you know it's a new culture for me, and it's a new poetry yeah. for me. And now that I have a folder this this thick from Wikipedia, I am diving into it. Um, and he seems to be the, the perfect poet for me, mm -hmm. accessible mm -hmm. in translation. Um, do you know any lines in, in Arabic that he wrote? I mean, I do know a few, but I don't know which one. There's so many. Um, I guess the, it's funny. Um, Sajil uh, an Arabi is one of the poems. It's that's the title, and it just says, uh, "Write down, I am Arab." Um, just to sort of give you an idea, at some point in his career, he was uh, revered for writing this like very famous poet poem uh -huh. called Sajil an Arabi, "Write down, I am Arab," uh, which is a kind of nod to uh, the sort of disproportionate bureaucratic BS that the Arabs. Uh, and Palestinians would have to deal with verses and stuff like that. And at the end of the poem, for example, he writes, um, I hate no one, but if I am made to be hungry, um, you know, I will, I will respond in a particular kind of way. Um, I, 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 but like after his career, he like looks back on that poem and the way people had received it. Um, and he, I don't know if he regrets it, but he says he wishes it didn't, like that wasn't the one poem that people sort of started associating, associating him with. Instead, he wished that other people would associate him with like different works, for example. Um, wow. Um, so, bottom line, he appeals to common humanity, all of us being human beings together loving and respecting the same things, land, mm -hmm. family, home. Um, and I think his poems in English have so captivated me that I can't get enough of them. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so it, you're right, it's land, family, home, but also a kind of eyeball to eyeball dignity. It um, is, that's so perfectly mm -hmm. said. And in the sense, like with this, at least like this relationship that. with Rita. Yeah. yeah. So after she ends up going and um, being part of this quartet and joining the Israeli army and stuff like that, and at some point she comes to his um, his defense when he's arrested in 1988 after reading a poem. Um, wow, what a part of the story that is. Yeah, and she comes to his defense, and then at some point she tries to rekindle things with him. Uh -huh. And he says, okay, thank you for coming in uh, under my, but you were a part of the Israeli army quartet and you were celebrating, right, something that is sort of predicated on my um, erasure. Yes, yes. So, you know, I loved you once and I, you know, maybe our love is enduring, or what, but it doesn't, you know, I have to respect myself in certain ways, right? And so he's a, he's a poet, but he's not kind of, uh, he won't capitulate to certain, uh, his principles in certain ways. That's what I picked up, the mm -hmm. values and the principles. And of course that intensifies through his life. Thank you, mm -hmm. that's such an insight for me mm -hmm. into his life. Um, we're gonna take a three minute break mm -hmm. and um, relax, have a sip of water. And the uh, service announcements are really worth watching. So we'll be back and uh, We'll do a second half of the show. We'll revisit the museum. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. 
The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're gonna take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, and so are you. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. With newspapers and media outlets merging all over the country, communities are losing their local voice. There's so much going on in the community that I think doesn't really, there's a lot of folks who are unaware of it. And I think things like this can bring it out into the community and in, in that way kind of bring the community together. Information and to our residents is the key to good governance and with the national media and local media not often covering us, this is an excellent opportunity for us constantly to communicate with our constituents and, and also to have them communicate with us. The best outcomes will be achieved through a community-based organization that grows its operation and scale by means of locally produced programming. All of our content is volunteer produced, so we do shows from talk shows to music shows, uh, working with high schools. VSCTV is committed to ensuring that the investment made to secure these powerful tools will pay great dividends in the community for many, many years. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With the unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know wherever you are. Welcome back. I take my hat off for this one and in respect for the sufferings of uh, fellow Palestinians. This is a poem just handed to me and it's called Revenge and it's a Palestinian poem. Taha Muhammad Ali, translated by Peter Coyle. At times I wish I could meet in a duel the man who killed my father and raised our home, expelling me into a narrow country. And if he killed me, I'd rest at last. And if I were ready, I would take my revenge. But if it came to light when my rival appeared that he had a mother waiting for him, or a father who had put his right hand over the heart's place in his chest, whenever his son was late, even by just a quarter hour for a meeting they'd set. Then I would not kill him, even if I could. Likewise, I would not murder him if it were soon made clear that he had a brother or sisters who loved him and constantly longed to see him, or if he had a wife to greet him and children who couldn't bear his absence and whom his gifts would thrill, or if he had friends or companions, neighbors he knew, or allies from prison, or a hospital room, or classmates from his school asking about him and sending him regards. But if he turned out to be on his own, cut off like a branch from a tree, without a mother or father, with neither a brother nor sister, wifeless, without a child, and without kin or neighbors or friends, colleagues or companions. Then I'd add not a thing to his pain within that aloneness. Not the torment of death 
and not the sorrow of passing away. Instead, I'd be content to ignore him when I passed him by on the street, as I convinced myself that paying him no attention in itself was a kind of revenge. Nazareth, April 15th, 2006. That's the most moving poem I think I've read by a Palestinian, even surpassing the depths of Darwish, because it's about appeal to common humanity and respect. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's special about Taha Muhammad Ali um, is, one is he's a Palestinian who lives in Nazareth, uh, which is Israel, which is Israel proper. Uh -huh. um, two, because pre pre nineteen forty eight Palestine. Uh -huh. So he has Israeli citizenship. Yeah. Um, and the person who translated the poem is Peter Cole, who's a Jewish, um, I think also Israeli citizen. I'm not sure. Um, professor at Yale University. Uh -huh. um, and so. It, and, and similar to Darwish's res, uh, relationship with Rita, for example, or the fictional character Rita, uh -huh. these things really puncture the stereotypes and how we think that people are categorized, right? You have, it's it, like the way we speak about it is as if there's a monolithic Jewish-Israeli population right. and a monolithic Palestinian Muslim population when 30% of Palestinians are, are Christian they live everywhere. Nazareth is a huge Christian, you know, town where Jesus was from, right? And it's so blurry. Um, and so it destroys the stereotypes, which are so poisonous. Hmm. Um, well, Peter Cole, mm -hmm. do you know him personally? No, I've uh, wanted to take his class for many semesters. Oh, maybe good for you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's such a wonderful, thank you for sharing this one particularly, because that seems to be what today's theme is, um, peace and justice, mm -hmm. which can only come through opening up to appeal mm -hmm. to our common humanity, which we're demonstrating through the spoken word mm -hmm. in everything we say. Mm -hmm. I think there is a kind of appeal to sort of cum, uh, to, to peace and justice, but I think in this poem at least, there's a justice in not, it's not like a kumbaya kind of piece, yeah. but it's a, a piece that allows him dignity by not even acknowledging, uh -huh. right? So he's at peace. And he's preserving yeah. his most valuable asset, yeah. which is his personal dignity mm. and personal self-respect. Mm -hmm. His humanity, most of all. And his humanity, which he shares yeah. with the person. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's why that gets underneath mm -hmm. in the most wonderful way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a week that um, celebrates, it's March 29th, mm -hmm. spring is around the corner. This is National Kindness Week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just saying that it's funny that not every week is National Kindness Week. <laughs> it's so sad that yeah. it's not national. Yeah. At the end of the week, we just uh, go back to <laughs> being nasty to each other. Year <laughs> kindness rather than week kindness. Yeah, uh, so many ironies in our mm -hmm. our lives, you know. Um, as as most of the students who are marching for their lives say, oh, no more thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Action, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's transition into the museums new acquisitions, sure. and also celebrate the upcoming opening of the Palestinian Museum U.S. We had a great, great hour show on the museum last time, and most folks watching us can flip back on the internet and go to show number 14, which is um, very accessible in terms of presenting what the museum will offer. But we're closer to the April 22nd, um, opening. You have new painters and uh, it would be wonderful to hear what the action is now. 
what's happening? So we are uh, very busy, obviously, uh, preparing for the opening, and we're uh, adding more artwork that uh, will be exhibited at the museum. Um, uh -huh. We're also making an arrangement for um, planning the, uh, the event. Uh, we have a four-hour event, and we're very busy planning each uh, minute of that event. Uh, ah, yeah. We are uh, receiving uh, calls from the international media to cover the event. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, we have uh, 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 AFP, which is uh, Agence, F Agence France Press, which is the equivalent, it's the French equivalent of uh, AP. Mm. Uh, and we also have a German uh, uh, news network uh, is wow. planning on covering the event, uh, and we uh, we hear we also believe Al Jazeera will be covering the, the event as well, and, this and is possibly uh, se uh, several other uh, uh, media outlets as well. Good. Um, so um, we've um, Dina uh, also will be reading poetry at the event as part of the literary aspect of the uh, of the museum. That's wonderful to hear, Dina. Uh, we are part of the program. Uh, receiving many Palestinian books that we will have on display at the museum, uh -huh. including uh, two one of the bestseller uh, Palestinian cookbooks. Mm -hmm. oh. um, one of them is called pa pa uh, Palestine on a Plate. And the other one, uh, the Gaza Kitchen, ah. and uh, these are very popular books, uh, and people are clamoring uh, uh, for for them, looking at recipes in them, and sharing the recipes all over the place uh, for for true Palestinian cooking. Uh, Broad-based cultural. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, how about the costumes? Did you come yeah, around to? Sure. Yeah, we have uh, a number of Palestinian dresses that will be on display. Ah, good. Uh, and in addition to the artifacts that we mentioned, uh, we have some old Palestinian passports that go back to the 30s, the 1930s and 1940s that carry the, uh, the title State of Palestine on them. Uh -huh. uh, these are British passports that were uh, uh, issued by the British government that was in charge of Palestine from, from 1917, 1919 to um, about uh, 1948. Uh -huh. uh, but they, they prove the fact that there was such thing as Palestine. Exactly. As some people uh, uh, claim that uh, the Palestine was a, uh, a land with, with no people and it was promised for people without a land. And uh, we have all the evidence to refute all these claims uh, in photographs, in, in documents, in passports, and passports, and people who are still living who were there at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Like Dina's grandfather who passed away, her grand uncle. You uh, seem really excited about it now yeah. as it's coming to, coming sure. to the day. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very, very um, exciting event. Everybody is so moved by it. Oh, and yeah. we expect, uh, we have a capacity of 100 seats and we expect that they will all be full. Sure. And the event is, uh, is actually by invitation because, because of the size lim space limitations. Um, uh, we have a, a few uh, pictures of some of the new artwork if we'd like to uh, Let's look at. Yeah. So uh, this photo is uh, uh, from uh, an artist in Gaza. His name is Maher Naji. And uh, it, uh, it kind of depicts the, uh, the harvesting of the, of the olive tree. And we will go back to this photo later on when we talk about another, uh, uh -huh. another poem uh, that's going to be published as part of a, a poetry book. Good. Uh, and uh, we have other, uh, this is also by the same artist in Gaza. This depicts the Palestinian women fetching the water from the, uh, f from the source, from the water source or, or, or the well. And they, they used to fill up uh, their clay pots and then carry them on their heads and walk with them b quite balanced. <laughs> Yeah, that's a trick. <laughs> and look at the beautiful, brilliant blues in yeah. that painting. Yeah. That's one thing that struck me about the museum, the colors. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, th this uh, painting is uh, by uh, a pre-48 uh, Palestinian who lives in a, a town called Umm al-Fahm, which is in the Galilee. Um, and it, it depicts the uh, uh, the cactus plant, what they call a sabr in Arabic, and this sabr is a, is a Palestinian symbol. And how you spell that? Uh, 
S A B R S A Sabar. Sabar, yeah, Sabar. Uh, and, and that's a, there a they are. beautiful yeah. uh, painting. Uh, and uh, by the same artist, uh, there's also uh, a couple of other uh, colorful paintings. Oh, look at that. Um, it's almost like yeah. Marc Chagall. Yeah. And there's another painting similar to this also in the same kind of style. Ooh. Uh, that one is quite long. It's, um, it, it, it's about three meters wide by a meter and a half oh, deep. That's huge. It, it, it's like a mural almost. Um, and then we have uh, one more uh, uh, artist, uh, Muhammad Harb. He's from uh, Gaza. He has two paintings that are very similar. They go side by side. Uh, he's also, um, uh, 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 he has a, a new film that won an award recently uh, about um, some sort of a kind of a documentary film. It's about uh, a, a woman from Gaza who became a fisherman. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to uh, screen that film at some point in the future in the museum as well. So a lot of, a lot of activities, uh, a lot of excitement. We are, uh, uh, we are receiving a lot of uh, email from people who are interested in attending the, uh, the opening of the museum and who want to be put on the mailing list of the museum. And we have a, uh, uh, an increasing follow, following uh, on, on Facebook and Instagram. We're almost up to 5,000 uh, likes on Facebook right now. And uh, all that within just a few months. Good for you. Congratulations, because this is like yeah. and by the way, one uh, of a kind. The logo, is, see, that's our logo that you see now. Uh -huh. And uh, as you can see, it is the Palestine Museum U.S., not the Palestinian. So I didn't right. want to correct you earlier. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, and you see, uh, this was designed uh, by a Palestinian artist who's 87 years old. Uh, he lives in uh, Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. And uh, he is coming to the opening also. His name is Raji Cook. Cook isn't his real name, but when his grandfather came off the boat, the immigration people have trouble figuring out his name. They just told him, from now on, you're Cook. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> All our grandfathers. And, yeah, so the, the, graphic, <laughs> the graphic part of the logo uh, is really uh, a Palestinian embroidery art. Uh. So that design is the most common Palestinian embroidery design. You see that on the women's dresses and, uh -huh. and everywhere. So we adopted that as the symbol for the museum. Good. Uh, it's we, in our effort, we want to preserve the Palestinian uh, history uh, and, the, and the artistic uh, uh, expressions and artistic uh, works. And to celebrate the people, mm -hmm. such as Dina's grandfather, mm -hmm. could yeah. we put him up on, did we get a picture of yes. him up there? I'm not sure. We did, yeah, it's right yeah. there. There he is. Oh, yeah, so one. glad. Thank you. I mean, I think uh, what's really special about the museum is one is it's in the United States, um, and we don't have a lot of institutions like that. Uh, institutions that really celebrate. Okay, being Palestinian and growing up in the United States, essentially you're in a culture and in a society that thinks that you don't exist. Exactly. And every day you're told that, right? And so having, for example, people who are established enough and know the kind of terrain well enough to be able to build institutions for you know, future generations to you know, see themselves and, and see something that they can be really proud of projected back at them is so important. It's so vital. It's such a gift. For society to mm -hmm. cultivate that. But no longer invisible yeah. is what mm -hmm. to celebrate mm -hmm. in all of its cultural manifestations. For Palestinians, uh, the museum in the US here is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a big yeah. thing. Uh, it is the first, uh, the first institution, the first presence uh, that really uh, speaks to the Palestinian culture and Palestinian art. Uh, and uh, Palestinians are so ex excited about it and they're so proud of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we're really looking forward to, to, to the opening and, and seeing that ceremony. I mean, I think one of the biggest things, it, so Faisal as a visionary in general, I've only known him for a few you know, a little while, but it, we grow up and we know that there's such a, 
a plethora and a richness of art and of literary expression and or but we because the communities are so uh, scattered yes it's so difficult to bring it all in one place and so I think it's really special that it's in Connecticut yes. of all places of in the all world places. Right? And it's a Connecticut yeah. which is a friendly place mm -hmm. uh, Frank I think uh, we have a few minutes left we do we, I want to talk just for a moment uh, uh, there is um, a, a book that's being uh, that's in the works right now. It will be published soon, uh, and it's a, a book of poetry. Uh, basically, there's one poem in the book, and the book is illustrated with olive trees. Uh, there are a lot of Palestinian artists that, that draw the olive trees, and so the book will consist of the of a poem called "Dressed in My Shade." And it is the olive tree talking in the poem. Oh, what a and wonderful figure. And the book figure. is by uh, Nora Lester Murad and, uh, and Dana Massad. And it will have uh, paintings, It will have the, the paintings and the, and, the, and, and the poetry. And the museum is sponsoring this book and will be publishing it uh, in the next few months. Uh, maybe with the time left, we can read a, a couple of Happy lines from it. there. Yeah. yeah. Um, the moody moon, silly birds, vicious sand, selfish drought, and almond blossoms, glorious and vain, turn after turn. Then came a family. Their grafts burned and throbbed, but they harmonized their seasons around my oily fruit. And I was more, I was more. Imagine the olive tree speaking directly. Then, after thousands of rings, everything changed. My story is, and then there'll be pictures. two pictures of olive trees, back to back. Metal, screeching, angry men, my valley no longer safe. We were not prepared, we could not have prepared Wind whooshed, sun beat, snakes hissed, mosquitoes stung in defense, but we were simply not prepared. For the bulldozer and shovel were bold and cunning. They ripped me from the soil that nurtured, whose embrace I had known forever. My story is old and young. Farmers and merchants, the hardworking and the playful, gone. That's very, very moving and powerful with the, the voice of the olive tree and the pictures mm -hmm. on the pages. I don't know if you've, uh, you've heard, there have been a lot of incidents where a lot settlers I've heard. Uh, uh, would come in and cut down olive trees that belong to Palestinian villagers and burn them mm -hmm. or steal their, their olive crops. And they, they, they operate with impunity. Mm -hmm. uh, they even send their dogs to terrorize the sheep that belong to the Palestinian shepherds. I've read that. Uh, and it, it's, it's so shocking to see that. Uh, uh, it's a, so this, this poem kind of uh, talks about, you know, the Gives olive tree. Voice. Yeah from the inside, the soul of the culture. Um, we have two minutes, and I'd like you to have the opportunity to leave us with some of your personal thoughts about your own poetry and experience. I mean, I think all of the poems that we read today um, and the impetus to start a Palestine museum um, you know, oh, our, yeah, our, you know, everyday idiosyncratic lives, what we do, uh, is, uh, again, in, in order to preserve and to protect and to defend who and what it is that we love. Our identity. Yeah. And to have a place that reinforces that mm -hmm. in the young people mm -hmm. is essential. Mm -hmm. I'm getting the full sense of how powerful the establishment of this Museum, the Palestine, Palestine, Palestine Museum, US. US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're so articulate <laughs> with feelings <laughs> as a poet should be. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for having us. We yeah, appreciate, really it. appreciate it. Second really pleasure. Special. Wonderful visit. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you um, publish your chapbook. Yeah. I'll be good. first in line. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, the sample poem you read was mm -hmm. just so moving for me. Um, and you're a grandpa too, is probably why. I'm a grandpa now, yeah, no. but I was thinking of my grandpa yeah. came over on the boat, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. all the deep feelings, and I have images of him floating through my dreams. Mm -hmm. I'd like to leave you with an image of hope. Mm -hmm. um, I've been dreaming the last two nights about watering plants, mm -hmm. and last night I took all these little morning glory seeds and soak them overnight as a symbol of growth and hope. And I planted them in all these little, little containers this morning. And I love doing that in the springtime because it's a flowering of hope for me, as is the olive tree. Thank you for sharing that. I look forward to seeing a copy of that book for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, best wishes with the opening day. Thank you. And you're reading, yeah. which is Thank so you. wonderful because you are integrating all the parts of Palestinian culture in one place. Pretty special. What a wonderful, wonderful We're show. Thank you. I'm so grateful you Thank came. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, a pleasure. Us. And to have the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, look forward to uh, seeing this next week online. I hope uh, you tune in. Monday nights at 8 o'clock. I'd like to thank Max, and he's cool on the camera and the cards, and Ken Butterworth, who is uh, here almost every time, loyal cameraman on the board of directors, Valley Shore Community TV, and Chris Morgan, right at the, the controls, was so with it on the photos. Yeah. That was yeah. really nice how to integrate that whole thing. Thank you for bringing those because the visuals mm -hmm. and the, the music um, enhance the experience. The whole open uh, process is so special yeah. in terms of that. So thank you for inviting us. Um, please come back. Mm -hmm. um, we did not dig deeply into all the rest of the poems. Mm -hmm. um, and I had several Palestinian poets ready to go, but mm. we'll need another hour. Yeah. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Loved having you guys. Yeah. Look forward to next time. Thank Us you. too. Yeah. And now we'll call it a wrap and uh, enjoy the music. What a colorful background that is. <laughs> Did you? Play? I love you.